Let's turn to 1 John 3 to begin today. I'd like to take a look at a familiar passage in God's Word. 1 John 3 will begin at the very beginning of the chapter. 1 John 3. Verse 1, he makes the statement here, as, as we know, uh, all of the book of at least this, uh, the, uh, this letter, 1 John, is dealing with love. So much of the theme of, of this uh, centers around God's love for us, how we demonstrate that we love God uh, in, in so many facets, God's nature. Of, of being love. God is love, as we, as we see in 1 John 4. But he makes this statement in verse 1 of chapter 3. He says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. You know, when you think about that, uh, all the things that you've dealt with this past week, all the things that I've dealt with uh, this past week, to pull back as we should every Sabbath, to pull back as we should every day, to pull back as we should throughout the day every day, to, to think, you know, what is it not incredible that God the Father has bestowed this love upon us, that he looks at us and he says, you are my children. This is the kind of love that God has bestowed upon us. I was not thinking about that this week. When uh, my daughter heard water going everywhere, came into our master bathroom and was in this much water that was going out, it was all over the floor in the bathroom, our new floor that uh, we had put down, and into the, the bedroom and water everywhere going through the carpet all the way out to the, to the window. I was not thinking about that. I was, nor was I an analogizing the Holy Spirit as water uh, at, that, at that point. It was very stressful uh, in terms of dealing with that. And of course, uh, that's, that's one little small thing that uh, the Burnett family dealt with this week. And, and please don't come up and, and feel sorry for me because our, our trials are very small in, in comparison uh, to, to many as I look out here today of the things that you are dealing with in your life you're dealing with extended family situations and looking after and caring for people, your own health situations. Uh, I know of one individual whom I hear making noises, bodily pain groaned noises as he sits and stands because he's in such pain, but he's here at services. Uh, I, I'm not dealing with that. I'm standing up straight and I feel fine. Uh, so many, many of you uh, are, are experiencing all kinds of stresses, not to mention uh, issues uh, that, that could be conflicts in, in families and all, all the different things. But, but we have stresses. We have stresses and God expects us though to be able to step back and always be in that mindset of I am so incredibly blessed that God, out of his love, has, has chosen to call me and draw me out of the world, to draw me into his family and call me a child of God. Perspective is such a critical piece of, of what it is to be a Christian. God wants us to, I, I say this, the, the more that I live this temporary life that I live, uh, this temporary existence, the more I recognize this passage. Let's read it. Uh, so he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know this. As, as we look out in the world, you know, of course, camp theme this year is light versus darkness, lights in the darkness. The world doesn't know that it is in darkness, but it, but it is. The world does not know us. They don't understand what God has given us, that, that realm in which we have been placed by God's calling, by his love. They, they, they don't grasp that. And, and it says, because it did not know him. Look at verse 2. Beloved, now we are the children of God. Notice this statement. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. The more and more I, I, I continue in God's way, the more and more I realize we do not know what we shall be. 
We, we see glimpses. We, as, as temporary human beings, we catch glimpses in Scripture of what this will be like, this, this future that God has, has, has planned for his, for his people, for, for all of mankind who comes into that family. But he says, it's not yet been revealed. It's not been revealed to us what we shall be. He says, but we know that when he's revealed, though, that we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. It's interesting what Mr. Greider talked about, about the, the heating of the dross and, and creating that situation when God begins to see his, his, himself in each of us. We know that we, we, we don't understand what it will, quite what that will be like, but we know we, by John's word here that God inspired John to write that we will, will be like him and we'll see him as he is. Let's, uh, let's turn now to 1 Corinthians 13, a uh, passage that we read at this past Sunday's wedding service. 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 9. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 9. Speaking of what we just read in in. 1 John 3 about this whole thing of we don't, we don't quite know what it, it, we will be, that we'll, we'll, we'll be like him. He says here in verse, verse 9, he says, For we know in part, and we prophesy, the, the, the telling forth of the divine counsel of God, as we talk about God's way and as we, as we read God's word, we know in part, and we prophesy in part. We don't see it all. We don't see it clearly. It's just in parts. Here or there, we get these glimpses of, of what this future might be like for us. But he says, but when that which is perfect or that which is complete, as the margin renders, when, when all of that has, has come, well, then that which is in part is going to be done away. The things that we know or the things that we're preaching and talking about and, and teaching from God's word that we understand in part, that, that is going to be put away because we will know in fullness. We will know in complete fullness. We will know in complete perfection. As Mr. Greider said, we will, we will eventually come to that point of perfection. And, and we will know these things in full, not in part, because the things that are in part are going to be done away and we know in full. He makes this statement then. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I, I thought about things as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So he's analogizing the maturation process of a human being growing up that, that puts away childish things, the things that were, were uh, the bottom line, you know, the basic kind of kids stuff uh, that, that, that don't correlate to a mature understanding of everything. So he, he says, I, I put that away. As I, as I read verse 12, uh, verse 11, about putting away childish things, I think about, as, as he says here, these, these actually these things that are in part right now, on that level, that scale of things, that understanding things, really will, will be totally insignificant, not insignificant, but, but of, of nowhere near the kind of value and fullness when we have the complete understanding. You, you see what I'm saying? So, so he says this is a, it's like a childish thing to coming to maturation. I pull back from that and look at, at my life now and say, Am I maturing as a man? Am I, am I coming into manhood spiritually? Am I, am I putting away the things that are really only in part? They are not what really matters. They're not the significant, important things of life. Our lives are filled with so many things that we've got to do, and we've got to meet this deadline and meet this deadline and do this and do this. I mean, I've got... I've got many things in my head right now of what I've got to do the next week before camp. You, you folks are, are, are in the same situation. You know what it's like to take a break from the Sabbath, uh, t take a break from the Sabbath, to take a break from the week and, and put those things away uh, and, and, and focus on the things that are really important. It's easy in our lives 
to continue to focus on the childish things in, in our human existence with God's spirit. We can, we can stay as a child spiritually uh, in thinking on those things, or we can progress into the more uh, mature kinds of thinking. So he says here in verse 12, he says, for now, and this is the way it is. Think, think about what we read in 1 John 3. Think about what we just read in 1, John, uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, 9. He says, for, for now, right now in our lives, in our, in our situation right now, in terms of what's ahead of us, all of these things of, of God's word and everything, of, of the fulfillment of that, he says, we see in a mirror dimly, an obscure and dark medium. We, we don't see it clearly yet. We, we don't see it... Uh, in its complete perfection. We don't see it in its absolute uh, straight on view uh, of a clear understanding of what all is ahead. But he says what's coming, when, when it happens, we're going to see it face to face. We're going to see it as it is. And, and, and Paul, the, the great apostle who called himself the least of all apostles, but an incredible work was done through him by the great God. But he says, now I just know in part but at that time, I am going to know just as I also am known. Paul kept his focus on that. Paul was striving to, de to, to develop the mind of God. He was striving to think as far ahead and as far into the, the perfection of what God is, has in store for us as possible. He, he was keeping his mind focused there uh, just, just as he was known. God wants us to strive to develop his mind. The receiving of the Holy Spirit serves as a major step in doing so. It, it's not the beginning. God, through his spirit, begins working with us. But then our, his spirit uh, dwells in us through baptism and the laying on of hands. And then we grow in that, that, that grace. We grow in that understanding. We grow uh, in, in the knowledge and in the mind of God through his spirit. As uh, 1 Corinthians 2 says, we can develop that. Here's a question for you as we begin today. What does God give us in scripture to help us catch a glimpse so that we can see through a mirror dimly, but grow in our ability to see through that mirror dimly. What does God give us in Scripture to help us catch a glimpse of what is in store for us? I want us to really think about that today. I want us to examine that question. I want you to examine that question for your spiritual health. Why? because it gives us purpose. <laughs> if, we don't, if we don't see that, and if we aren't thinking on that level, we struggle with purpose when things get rough because it gives us perspective. It gives us perspective when we're cleaning up the water, when we're ripping up the floor because the water is under the floor and uh, we don't wanna have mildew. Uh, when we're lifting up the toilet in the bathroom, when the, the tile or the, the flooring that we put is actually under the toilet. When we're picking up the wax ring, and those of you that deal with the wax ring know how gross the wax ring is. When you're picking up the wax ring and getting another wax ring and putting the new wax ring on the toilet as we put the toilet back down on the old tile floor while we're letting everything, you see what I'm saying. We, we, it gives us perspective through the little Burnett trials in the bathroom. That sounds awful. I didn't mean that. So <laughs> the uh, construction issues that I'm dealing with in the bathroom. Okay, another, another faux pas by Burnett. Okay, but dealing with that, it gives us perspective when our back is not working and we're in tremendous pain and all we can think about is the pain that's in our back. It gives us perspective when we're going through a horribly... Uh, 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 detached relationship that we cannot seem to figure out how to fix uh, with, with, an, with another individual who is at odds with us. It gives us perspective when we lose jobs. It gives us perspective when we deal with financial difficulties. It gives us perspective when we're battling our own nature. Uh, to, to understand and to strive to really catch that glimpse of what's in store for us. 
So that's what we're going to address today. It, because God wants us to look at the future with the mind of God that he is putting in us. He wants us to look forward into eternity with his mind. Uh, our, our mind yielded to him, not just the spirit in man, but the spirit of God, which, which dwells in us and works with us and works with the spirit in man as we reason and think on his ways to develop that mind. He wants that from us. What is God going to give us? We're going to go to the feast here, and, and I would be shocked if we do not hear a message on Revelation 1, Revelation 5, kings and priests, priests, kings, king priests, the various roles that, that we, uh, as, as those who are part of the first resurrection, are changed to spirit beings, uh, as, as 1 John 3 says, uh, to, to be like him and see him as he is, that we will be kings and priests and reigning uh, in, in the millennium, reigning and teaching. Uh, Jesus Christ said in John 14, I believe it was, or 14, I think it was, uh, I go to prepare a place for you. What, what does he mean by that? What is, what's, as we look at that, do we look at, at what he has in store for us, do we look at that from a human perspective, or do we strive to look at that? Do we strive to catch that glimpse with the mind of God that he's putting in us so that we can have perspective in going through the challenges that we're going to face from here out till Jesus Christ returns or until, or until we're six feet under. Let's go to Romans 4. Let's go through some passages today and, and reflect on these things. Revelation, sorry, Romans, Romans 4, verse 13. Let's, let's look, look there. Speaking of uh, the, the promise of, of Ab to Abraham that was granted uh, by faith, his, uh, the faith that, that God had, had given him and, and his faith as he yielded to God's word that, that he believed that it was so. Verse 13, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or, or to his seed through the law. It wasn't done through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Uh, that, that through that faith and that belief, God, uh, God worked through Abraham, and Abraham believed that it was so. Did you notice the other statement, though, in this? What did it say was, his, was that he was going to be? He was going to be the heir of the world. The heir of the world. Now, again, I, I, want, us, I want us to think today in terms of the future I want us to really strive to, to uh, how would I say it, just take on the mind of God and think about this through this incredible being who is a God of love, of what God has in store for you and me, what God has in store for humanity because of his love for all of humanity. Heir of the world, Matthew 5, 5, the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 5, Jesus Christ, uh, the blessed are the different things that he says there. Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, the humble, uh, the, not the self-willed. Uh, doesn't mean that we can't be assertive, but the humble and, and the individuals who are not self-willed. It's not about me, the gentle, the mild. The actions are in self-control, in seeking God's will in everything. Blessed are these individuals, for they shall inherit the earth. They shall inherit the earth. We know the, the parable about the parable of the pounds and the, uh, the, the, the increase in this. This person did this, so he got uh, double. He got uh, this many cities, and this person got ten cities. Uh, remember... Uh, God is a God of increase. God, I believe personally that Jesus Christ was striving to, to teach here that God is a God of abundance. Uh, we follow God, we serve him fully, and he will bless us abundantly. Uh, 
some get caught in, in looking at some of these things and start thinking, uh, you know, millennium, okay, we've got kings. Now, let's see, we got this knocked out. David, David's got Israel. He's in charge of Israel. Jesus Christ sits on the, the throne, but then you've got David, and then you've got, oh, the, the 12, 12 apostles. They're, they're ruling over the 12 tribes. So now where am I going to fit? What, will I have some cities? Will I, will I be working in the temple? Will I be doing this or uh, doing this? What, what I want us to do today is really to strive to, to look at what, what God is doing for us and what God wants to give us, with, and I want us to do that with the mind of God through looking at his word. Those leading and serving and, and teaching through the millennium, through a temporary time period of 1,000 years, and then whatever period that great white throne judgment is, those things are temporary. They, they, are, they are temporary. They are, they are not eternal. Uh, he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, the, the land. They, they shall inherit that. They, they, it's, it, a father gives to the son. A father gives to the, the, the firstborn, gets the inheritance. They, they inherit the earth. Let's look at th Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Jesus Christ may have been referencing this passage as he, as he talks, uh, uh, talked about what he did in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Psalm 37, verse 9. Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verse 9. Of course, as we've talked before, Psalm 37 and, and Psalm 73 uh, show the, the opposites of of the way of wickedness and what that yields and the way of righteousness and what that yields. But he says here, as he contrasts the two, verse 9, for evildoers shall be cut off. They're going to be destroyed. There, there is ultimately, there is the second death. Death is, is even put away, ultimately. But those who wait on the Lord, hopefully that represents you and me. We are waiting on the Lord. We are waiting on, on God as, as we watch his plan. We are patient with with, with God and his plan for us. Those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth <laughs> for yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and they shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Peace I give you, not of this world. Uh, those who, you know, the whole thing of Philippians 4 about the peace of God, which passes all understanding. We, we will delight ourselves in the abundance of peace as we inherit the earth. Look at uh, Revelation 2 as we, as we go to the, the, the churches, the messages to the churches I've always looked at Revelation 2 and 3, and I think, I think all of us would do this, not as a situation where, okay, this church gets these, gets these blessings, this church era or this church region gets these blessings. It, it's not that. It's, it's he, as he's going through the, message to the messages to the seven churches, God wants us to focus on all of the, those churches and all of the, the, what, what is coming as, as part of the, the return of Christ and, and when we are uh, a part of the, of the family of God from the standpoint of being like him as he is, changed to be like him. He gives us these glimpses, these little pieces of information uh, about uh, just a, a, a tiny glimpse of what this is going to be like, on, on what kind of level of existence that, that we will have uh, as spirit being children of God, the glimpse of the totality of what's in place. Verse 7 of chapter 2, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life. The tree of life represented e eternal life. I will give to eat from that. Uh, again, uh, whom such the second death will have no power. These individuals will, will, will eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God, the, the actual tree of life that's in God's paradise, that is in heaven. The, 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 the throne is there, the tree of life is there. That's part of, as we look future in, into uh, Revelation 22, we see that that what it, what it symbolizes, it symbolizes life, real life, true life. 
being in the midst of God. That's, what, that's an element of what he's giving us. Chapter 2, verse 17. Chapter 2, verse 17. He, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. The hidden manna. Well, well Israelites had manna. Uh, Jesus Christ said, I am the bread of life. You eat of me, uh, you will not die. There is this, this hidden manna, the, again, this essence of, of what it is to, to uh, have eternal life, the, the real bread that gives real life. I'll give him a white stone, and on the stone a, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. We heard a sermon on that recently. Verse 26, verse 26 of the same chapter. These individuals who overcome and keeps my works until the end, to him, to that individual, he says, I will give power over the nations. He's talking about nations here. That individual, as part of the family of God, uh, will, will be given power over the nations. He'll rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. He says, this is Jesus Christ saying this, as I have also received from my Father. Jesus Christ received that. He has power over the nations. And he says to him who overcomes, he joins in with Christ to have power over the nations. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the seven churches. The morning star. Well, Christ himself is the morning star. Revelation 3, verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, perfectly pure and clean. Again, analogous to uh, Mr. Mr. Grider's sermonette. The, the, the perfection in, in being clean and pure. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life. The individuals in, in the faith who have been baptized and have received God's Holy Spirit have their names written in the book of life. Our names are written in the book of life now. We do not want our names to be blotted out of the book of life. He says, I, I uh, will you know, confess his name before my Father and before his holy angels. Verse 12, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. Uh, so he says, I will make this individual a pillar in the temple of God. You know, so does that mean, okay, we'll be in the pillar, we'll be the pillar and we'll stay there, there in the tabernacle. It'll be really good because we'll be there, but we'll be, we'll be a pillar, so we won't get to move a lot. You know, what, what's he talking about? He's talking about being in the presence of God, in the household of God, the dwelling place of God, a, a, a feature part of that. Uh, so symbolic of, of this incredibly close relationship that we have with the, with the Father in heaven. And I'm going to write on that person the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem that comes down from, from out of heaven, then that name of the new Jerusalem is written on that person's head for eternity. And think of the symbolism of what's going there. I'll write on him my new name. Verse 21, to him who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Power over the nations. Not only that, Jesus Christ, the Son of God that sits at the right hand of God, he brings the other individuals there with him to sit with him on his throne uh, in the presence of God as, as he says here, with, with power over the nations. It just gives us, and, and even this is a glimpse, this is a glimpse of what it is to be in the family of God for eternity. It's just a glimpse. Let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Actually, for those of you who have your Bibles in your hand, put your finger there if you would, and let's go to Colossians 3 first. Colossians 3. Colossians 3, 
verse 24, he makes the statement here in the middle of, after, after talking with, with the role of the wives, as after talking with the role of servants, after uh, talking with the role of fathers and children, uh, all of that, he says, whatever we do, verse 23, we do it heartily, we do it as to the Lord, and we don't, not to men, but because we're, we're serving God in, in serving others. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. What is the inheritance? We've talked about a glimpse of that uh, as we've read of the churches in Revelation, as we've seen a bit of what it is that God has in store to give us as his children what else does he say? Look at verse 1 of chapter 3. Here, here is that, that another discussion in Scripture about how critical it is for us as his people to be able to be in this world and to step back and look at life with the mind of God, to look at, to look at our existence from the standpoint of, of the mind of God, to look at the temporary nature of this, and, and to also look at what's at stake here for eternity for us. We've got to keep that in mind if we're to go forward, uh, as God would have us. If then you were raised with Christ, I was at baptism, I was raised with Christ. Seek those things which are above, am I? Am I, am I think, seeking those things which are above, or am I embroiled in the needs and the wants and, and the things that are part of this life? Am I doing this? Ask yourself that. Am I doing this? Am I truly seeking to where that is what drives me, that's what my thought is I, as, as I go through the stresses, as I go through the joys of life? I am thinking of the things that are above. Th seek those things, because that's where Christ is. He is sitting at the right hand of God. Christ has said, I'm going to put this person right here beside me, as we just read. Set your mind on things above. Don't set your mind on things on the earth. Well, we've got to live. We've got to do the things that we've got to do. Yes, we do. But keep that mindset. It's got to, got to stay there. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. He makes the statement as he talks a little bit later in the chapter. Right, let's look around oh, 10 or so. How we've put on the new man, uh, renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Uh, where it doesn't matter what we are, Greek, Jew, uh, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, it doesn't matter. But notice what he says here because this begins to give us a better picture of what the inheritance is, okay? What is this inheritance that God has for us? Is it, I'm going to get two or three cities? Well, well what about this guy? He got, he got four or five. It, it, or this guy's got this or this guy's got that. The disciples got into that discussion. Who's going to get what? And Christ is trying to say, step away from that. Step away from that. Look at me, he says. Look at me. I, I came and I'm going to inherit all things, yet I came as a servant. Uh, I know what, what lies in eternity. I know what is out there. I know this of what God is going to make when he makes all things new. I get that. I come as a servant because God's going to give us everything. He's going to give us everything, and he was trying to get them to, to understand that. It is difficult for us as human beings to step back enough and it can only be done through the mind of God that he puts in us through his Holy Spirit as we dwell on it to see, to begin to catch a glimpse of the potential that's out there for us, uh, of what God wants to give his family. So, so he makes uh, that statement then at the end, verse 11, where there is neither this or this or this or this, but then he makes the statement, but Christ, Jesus Christ, is all... And in all. Well, that sounds like some kind of evangelical thing. Christ is all, and he's in all. It's, it's all great. But, but think about what, what's he saying? He's, he's saying that, that Jesus Christ is, is God created all things through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is, is in it all. Jesus Christ, as we're going to see here in a, in, a, in a scripture here in a second, he is over all. And 
and God and the Father, God the Father and Christ are, are all going to be in all of that. That's what we seek because we are going to be part of them. We're, we're going to receive it all. Christ is all in all. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 3 as I asked to keep our finger there. 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians 3, uh, verse 18. We, we cover this from time to time, and I think, uh, again, it especially relates to what Mr. Greider uh, covered here uh, earlier today. But we all, as a result of, of as, as verse 17 says, 16, the veil is taken away. Uh, the, where the, now the Lord is the Spirit, uh, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Uh, free from, from, that, from the penalty, uh, ultimately, which is eternal death. There, there is liberty in that. So he says, behold, we, we all, all of us, uh, there's a little bit of text in there, but we all, with, with unveiled face, Beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord. This isn't the dimly uh, looking into a, a glass dimly, looking into a mirror dimly, not being able to see exactly what's in store of the future. This is talking about this, this reflection that uh, Mr. Greider was discussing. As, as we develop the mind of God, as we grow in that understanding and as we think like him, we start beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We, we are being metamorphosed. We are being transformed into, the, we're going through this process of being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord, from, from one degree of glory to another, this transforming metamorphosis that's taking place in us, uh, and it's, it's done so through the Spirit of God. This is, that, this is that developing the mind of God and understanding that. Okay, all right, so with that, let's go now to Ephesians 3. As I go through life and uh, don't know if I've got a, a lot of years left or just a few or a few days, you never, you never know. But as, as, I, as I go through life, I'm, I'm beginning to, to grasp a, a glimpse of, of what's really, really important. And uh, I, I want all of us to think about it because uh, it's what gets us through. Otherwise, uh, life becomes disappointing. And may we never, as God's people, knowing what we read in 1 John 3, understanding the, the love that God has for us, may we ever see our lives as a disappointment because you are very important to God. He is, he is your Father, He is my Father, and He wants to give us all things. Paul, Paul says, as he thinks about this dwelling place of God in the Spirit, that, that God's placed us in that, we're fitted together in this because he loves us and he wants us to be a part of that. He says in verse 1 of chapter 3, he says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if indeed you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have made briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of God. He says these, this, this mystery, this understanding of, of, of our being a part of God's family, uh, Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, he says, as, as a result of our, our knowing this, he says, this in other ages, verse 5, was not made known to the sons of men. They did not grasp that. It, it, but it's now been revealed and it's been done so through the Spirit to his holy apostles and to the prophets that the Gentiles as well should be fellow heirs, fellow heirs, heirs of God, heirs of, of, of God the Father who is bestowing his inheritance, he's, he's bestowing that uh, as, as the, the one who is the Father, who owns all, he's bestowing that upon his inheritance to his, to his children. 
that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. For this reason, this is why he said, I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. He says to me, as he looks at his own life and, and all the things that he had done prior to his calling, I, I'm less than the least of all the saints. This grace was given to me, though, that I should preach the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I, I would ask us to spend some time as we go through and see the, the craziness of this world. Uh, as, uh, as Cat Stevens sang, ooh, baby, baby, it's a wild world. It is a wild world out there. It is going to get crazier and crazier. But, but we must, as lights in the darkness, we must look into this, this mystery, this, this precious truth, the, which are the unsearchable riches of Christ. And he says, and to make all see, what, what's the fellowship, the sharing of that mystery that we have? Uh, the sharing that God wants to give to all of us, the sharing, the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Christ. To the intent now that the manifold wisdom, this uh, greatly diverse, diversified means of the church here, uh, this, this whole, all of this, this manifold wisdom might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Even the angelic realm was revealed these, these kinds of things, the variegated, multifaceted wisdom of God by seeing the plan of redemption for mankind begin to unfold. They began to see that. And, and we've been given a glimpse of what that, of what that might be like, of, of, of what God has in store for us through Jesus Christ. Verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, uh, our Lord. As a result of that, we can have boldness. We can have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, just as, as Paul said in verse 13, that we not lose heart in, in his tribulations uh, that, that he had for them, nor should any of us lose heart in other people's tribulations that they have and, and our tribulations that they have. We don't lose heart in that because we see what's ahead. We see the unsearchable riches of Christ. We see the glimpse of the future of what he's going to give us and mankind. He says, as a result of, he says, which is ultimately for your glory, verse 14, for this reason, knowing all of this, Paul says he gets on his knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He gets on his, his knees to this individual from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, and, and as a result of that, he asks God to grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. This is what we seek. This is what we, we hope others are asking for us. This is what we're asking for others, that God would strengthen us with might through his spirit in the inner man as our bodies grow and age and deteriorate that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Remember what we talked about before in 1 John 3. God, be, behold what manner of love God, God is spirit, God is love, that what, what manner that God has had for us. He wants us with the mind of God to be rooted. The roots go deeper and deeper and deeper down into the ground and grounded in that love that he has for us. Only when we, we recognize that as God's people, with his mind in us, with the love of God in us, only then can we begin to do verse 18. Can we begin to, to comprehend, to, to begin to grasp, to begin to catch a better glimpse of, of what God is doing for us and what he's, what he's doing, going to ultimately do for all of mankind. With all the saints, what is the width? What is the length? What is the depth? What is the height? To, to know what that love is. This love of, of, of not only the Father, but the love, verse 19, of Jesus Christ. It's the love that passes knowledge because we only know in part. We only prophesy in part. We only have glimpses of things in part. But we have the love of God and God's love for us 
is what surpasses knowledge. It surpasses all of that. But he says, as we continue, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That is our goal in this life. As, as we realize we are temporary human beings through God's love, which passes knowledge, we desire to be filled with the fullness of God. I really want my bathroom floor to be fixed. But, but this is a little more important. This is a little more important. I really would like to be in perfect health. This is more important. I would really like to have a great job. I, I have a great job, but I'm saying, you know, I'm speaking all of it. I would really like to have this job. I would really like to be married in this situation. I would really like this and this. Those, those are, are good things for which to seek. But what he's saying is, is our desire is to be filled with the fullness of God. Remember what we said before as we read that scripture? Christ is all and in all. The fullness of God. The mind of God by, by dwelling on the mind of God and by, by developing the mind of God, we begin to experience the fullness of God and greater grasp what it is, the glimpse of what it is to have Christ uh, being all in all. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Think about this for a second. Think about some of the friendships that you've had in life. Um, go back as far as you want. Some of maybe individuals who were your closest friends, maybe some who are now your closest friends. Think, think of those. I'll give you a little time to think, but think of some of those individuals. Uh, then... Then try to take out of that uh, a couple of key experiences, uh, key events in your life where you can remember a, a moment in time with a very close friend that you spent and what that experience was like in that moment, what you were doing, what you were talking about. And, and as you look back, you have very fond memories on the closeness and connectedness that you had with that individual at that point. Think, think about some of those, those, those times. I can think of uh, uh, several through the years. I, I think of one uh, recently with a friend here in this congregation. We talked uh, on a very, uh, a very uh, up close and personal manner about uh, some issues in, in the, the individual's life as we, we went back and looked at it all. And I, and I felt a, a closeness to that individual that had been a friend, but a greater connectedness than I had ever experienced with that individual, and it was very inspiring. It was very comforting to be talking with a brother in Christ who loves God's way, who's learned through the, the challenges that, that he's faced in life and has come, come to this understanding, and to share that with him. That was a precious moment, a moment in time that I experienced that I will never forget. And I have other ones that were not as deep, but I will never forget them. Uh, one was a fellow by the name of John Register. I went to college with John. Uh, we were sophomores together in Big Sandy. And back in the day in, in Texas, uh, we had an open container law, right? You guys remember that? Uh, you could have an open container in the car uh, as in an alcoholic beverage, and that was perfectly legal. How many of you were not aware of that? Anybody here not aware of that? Okay, anyway, so, yeah, boy, all these drinkers here, except, except Marguerite. Marguerite's the only one who didn't know that. They're French. They drink wine. They don't deal with beer anyway. Oh, sorry. Okay, bad. I shouldn't have gone there. Sorry, Marguerite. Um, anyway, it's on the internet, so everybody just talked about Marguerite Dubois Meeker. Uh, anyway, sorry. Just kidding. Okay, back to focus. Uh, so we, we could have an open container law. So I remember uh, we... Uh, John and I, who had not been close friends, but been acquaintances, we went to the Sandy Center, little little uh, convenience store, and bought a, a decent-sized beer and a very decent-sized uh, bag of Dorito, nacho Dorito uh, chips. And we drove to the little uh, rest area there, about a half mile from the, the campus, and sat there, perfectly legal, 
and sat down in his tiny little four-door Datsun that didn't have air and was basically a piece of junk, but he had uh, wheels and I didn't. Uh, and we sat there and ate that entire uh, bag of nacho cheese Dorito chips and, and had a beer and, and talked about life and connected. I, I will never forget that. John has since died. Uh, he uh, contracted some type of illness and, and died in, in South America. He had moved uh, to there. But I uh, appreciated that, that closeness uh, that, that we had at, at that moment and that connectedness that we had. Parents, think of some of the, the most precious moments that you can remember with each of your children. Uh, those times when you felt especially connected to them, whatever you were doing at the time and whatever you were discussing or, or just being together and, and how that, that felt, that, that love and that connectedness. As kids, think about as we, when we were kids, those times that we felt completely at peace, uh, completely connected with our father, completely connected with our, our mother, uh, doing what we did with mother with my mother she played games with us and we we had some great times playing games with my dad it was when I could go fishing with him and just be with my dad uh, and and be out in nature fishing and connecting with him I, I I will never forget those situations I remember on the St. John's River up uh, above North Bay up in Ontario we were on a vacation and just just to be with him there and uh, fishing for walleye and catching walleye on this, this river that was really a, a big stream uh, with, with a drop off on each side, but nobody else there out in the wilderness fishing for walleye with my dad and, and being with him, that, that connectedness that I felt. Reflect on these, these kinds of things. I mean, I mean really reflect on these. Think of them in terms of, of, again, those fondest memories when you felt most connected. Romans 8, verse 12. Romans 8. Verse 12. He says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. We're not to, not to the flesh, debtors to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. But if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. If we do not develop the mind of God, we will die. We, we can only develop the mind of God through the mind of God, which, which comes through us and in, in us, through his dwelling in us, through his spirit. But, so if we live according to the flesh, death awaits us. But if we live by the spirit, we put to death the deeds of the body, then, then we live. So here he gets into this, this inheritance aspect. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but, but you received the spirit of adoption. He's brought us in to, to, his, to his family, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God. So if we're children, then we're heirs. And, and if we're heirs of God... And we're, we're also joint heirs with Christ. We are joint heirs with Christ. That, that, is, that is truth. Is he talking here just about an heir with Christ in, in terms of, of having, being given eternal life? Is that the only element that he's talking about here, to be heirs with Christ? I mean, I'm not downplaying what it is to receive eternal life. I mean, that, that is a gift. That is an incredible gift that he is giving us uh, again, because we are his, we are to inherit uh, all things. He, he, he gives that to us because we are his children. But, but is, is that what he's talking about here? Joint heirs with Christ, only on the, on the level of being able to receive eternal life. Well, we just read some of the different things in Revelation 2 and 3 of, of the abundance that is the glimpse of the abundance of what God has in store for mankind who is changed to be like him. But he says, if, if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Not just heirs, but joint heirs along with Christ, the one who has us there by his side at the throne of God. 
if indeed we suffer with him, verse 17. We must suffer with him. That is a necessary tool. Uh, it, gets, it, it gets rid of the dross as we're heated. Uh, it, uh, but it also uh, is a part of the Christian process. For what reason? That we may also be glorified together. Revelation 21. Revelation 21, as we see God making, uh, God bringing, God the Father bringing the new heavens and new earth down here and replacing all things. I want you to still think about those friendships and relationships, those moments in time. We're going to hit that in just a sec. Revelation 21, verse 5. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. This, this is going to be new now, what you're going to experience. He said to me, right, these, these words are faithful and true. These are the true things that are going to happen. He is literally going to make all things new. It's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I'm going to give now of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Notice this statement, verse 7. We've been saying it, but now we're going to read it. He who overcomes, well, okay, yeah, we, we saw all those things in Revelation 2 and 3. Yeah, you're, you're going to get this, 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 this. I'm trying to get a glimpse. Here it is. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. How many, how many cities? Uh, king, priest, which, which am I going to do? What, what's this? What's this? Uh, in the end, he makes all things new. We are brought in to... Uh, the situation of God the Father himself comes down to dwell with spirit mankind for eternity. And he makes all things new. And we who have overcome, overcome uh, shall inherit everything, all things. And he says, I will be his God and he shall be my son. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. I think it, it, is, it is difficult for us as human beings to grasp this kind of level of existence, uh, to, to inherit all things, uh, and, and to read the kinds of things that we read in, in Revelation about what's in store uh, for us as part of the family of God. It's difficult to grasp this, but it becomes clearer to the degree that we understand the mind of God and, and by extension, the love of God. This passage here speaks specifically to the love that Jesus Christ has. What, what love is and, and what love is as love wields power. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, then comes the end. It talks about, you know, the, the, the resurrection, Christ the first fruits. Okay, so then we, then we come to the end. This is uh, ultimately here as, as we're looking at the, on, on the cusp of the new heavens and new earth coming down because verse 26 says the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. We know the, the, the final resurrection cast into the lake of fire and even death is destroyed. But he says here, let's, let's start in verse 24. Then comes the end when he, speaking of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ then delivers the kingdom. He, de he, is, he is over all things. He has power over all the nations. He controls all of that. Jesus Christ then delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When Jesus Christ puts an end to all rule and authority and power, he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has, for he has put all things under his feet. Jesus Christ has all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it's evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Who was he who put all things under Christ? God the Father. So, so Jesus Christ, this, this is the ultimate of love, what Jesus Christ did here, is going to do, because it speaks to the, what conversely Satan has no grasp it, it speaks conversely to what mankind, without the knowledge of God and without the, the mind of God and without the love of God, can understand. Is that, you remember how, how Satan said, Jesus, you know, 
bow down to me and I'm going to give you all, I'm going to give you all of these kingdoms. Jesus already knows that, that he has will, will when he comes back and reigns. Uh, he is in charge of everything now, of course. He, nothing happens that he doesn't allow. But when he comes back and, and establishes his government and ultimately even puts away death, everything will be under Christ. What, what do you got to offer me, Satan? You want to offer me the kingdoms of this world? I, I have everything, everything except God the Father under me. And what does Jesus Christ do who has everything? This is the love of God. This is the love of the great being who gave his life for us. This is what he does. He says, Now when all things are made subject to him, Jesus Christ, the Son who is the, is the, is the giver, he is the great giver. God the Father is the great giver who gave his Son. The, the Son who is the great giver who perfectly fulfills the will of his Father in everything. What does he do? He gives it all to the Father. Why does he do that? Then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him. He, 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 makes, he puts himself then under God. And for what reason? Because he understands the connectedness that God wants to give all of mankind. The family atmosphere that God wants to bring uh, to all of human beings. To give them the opportunity to be like him. To be as he is. To be with him for eternity in his family, that God may be all in all. We're talking about the future of mankind. The future for you and me is, is that God will be all in all, and we will be part of that God family. We will inherit all things. It's, it's, it's about this, this relationship to come into to experience all of the universe, all that there is, and in coming back to those relationships then, that, that relationship that we have in our friendships, those precious times, those precious times that we have in our, in our friendships uh, with, with those in the faith, with, with parents, with, with children, and then marriage. Think, think of those precious times in marriage that, that you have, that, that, that I've had that only my wife and I know about the things that the closeness that we have on, on all kinds of different levels, precious experiences that are, are wonderful as we reflect on what God gives us with this gift of marriage, what God gives us with the gift of being with brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, with having friends, with the family relationship. All of those things are just a glimpse. They're just a smidgen of, of the reality of what being in the eternal family of God will be like. They just give us a glimpse, and it's a beautiful thing to have those, but we realize we see through the glass darkly. Back to 1 Corinthians 15 now. I pray that they may be one, that you and I are one that God may be all in all. Brethren, this is, this is what's ahead of us. It's, it's the inheritance of all things. It's, it's being with God, being a part of that family, be, experiencing all of that and as, as he makes all things new. I'd like to read uh, 1 Corinthians 15 uh, from uh, Heinz Kassirer's translation as, as you read along. Let's start this time in verse 8 because this comes back to the, the mind of God and, and ultimately not just the mind of God, but behold what manner of love God has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. This is... This is the love of God to give us that, to, to give all mankind that opportunity to, to experience that on that level. Verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 13 in the New King James says, Love never fails. Kassirer translates, translates it this way. Love, God is love, love will never come to an end. We are, we are going into an eternity of love. As for prophecies, they'll be swept out of the way. As for tongues of inspiration, they will cease. As for knowledge, the, the knowledge that we know in part, it will be swept out of the way. 
For this is how matters stand. It is but part of the truth which we lay hold of in our knowledge, in our prophesying. And when the time comes for the completeness of things to show itself, well, that which yields us but partial glimpses of, the, of, of that will be swept out of the way. So verse 12, halfway through, at present my knowledge is one yielding but partial glimpses. That's, that's all we've got right now are partial glimpses. But there will be a time when we shall know completely, even as God from the first completely knew me. Meanwhile, faith, hope, and love endure. But the greatest of them is love. Let's close by going to Philippians 3. Brethren, I, I hope today that it, it, it gives us some food for thought as we've gone through the scripture to think about the inheritance, to think about that and strive to, to move, continue to move forward as I'm trying to move forward out of the childish things and move into developing this mind of God to think like he does, to think on the level of the love of God. As I do that, I know this to the degree that I do that, to the degree is, is the degree to which I have better perspective. It's to the degree to which I better handle the stresses that come along. It's to the degree that I, I, I find more purpose in my life. So Paul concludes, which we'll conclude today, this, this thought in speaking of, of what's been laid up for us. Paul makes this statement in Philippians 3, verse 12. You know, we're not there yet. He says, not that I've already attained. I, I, I haven't gotten there yet. I, I've not completely grabbed a hold of it and said, I've got this full on. I know exactly what it is. No, I've not already attained or, or I'm not already completed either. I'm not already perfected. I'm not there yet, but I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. As we go forward, brethren, let's grab on to, to those glimpses that God gives us. Let's grab on to Jesus Christ. But remember, brethren, in, in, in God the Father's love for us and in Jesus Christ's love for us, he is grabbing hold of us.